Welcome to episode 26 of the SWNZ podcast, the podcast for New Zealand Star Wars fans. My name is Matt. And my name is Christy. Just as a quick note before we jump into our bigger conversation points, if you are following this podcast on the SWNZ YouTube channel, you will have seen that we got a new New Zealand Star Wars collectible video out in the last 24 hours. Check that out. We take a close look at the New Zealand Women's Weekly Star Wars comics. I mentioned that last week, but it is live now. Subscribe to this SWZ YouTube channel for notifications of new videos about New Zealand Star Wars collectibles. An interesting thing I want to talk about a little bit today is the fact that um, a few podcasts back we talked about May the 4th being celebrated as Star Wars Day, but in the past week we've crossed over the 25th of May, which is a date that was celebrated in some ways as a Star Wars Day prior to May the 4th really catching on. And the reason for that is, as many of you will know, most of you will know, 25th of May 1977 is the date that Star Wars premiered in the United States. It doesn't hold a lot of significance for New Zealanders directly, but I think it is a, a notable historic date because there is a point in time before which there was no Star Wars, and a point in time after which there was some Star Wars and then much Star Wars, and that date, that point in time is the 25th of May. It's interesting that back when the movies were coming out in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge lag before we got them in New Zealand. And this is something we talk about on the SWNZ website and a a couple of times, specifically in articles about when the movies actually premiered in New Zealand. For Star Wars itself, A New Hope, the lag was many, many months. It wasn't until the 24th of December that the movie showed up in Auckland theatres and that date was actually delayed from the 16th of December where it screened in other theatres around the country because of some issues with theatres not being open on the date that Star Wars was scheduled to be released. There were similar delays for The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, which opened on the 21st of May 1980 in the US and the 25th of May 1983 in the US respectively. That delay diminished a little bit, with The Empire Strikes Back showing up in New Zealand on the 5th of December that same year, and earlier still the 25th of November that same year. So that cluster of dates, middle of the year, um, the pattern of releasing movies actually flowed through to the prequels as well. Episode 1 has its anniversary on the 19th of May. It came out in 99, obviously. Episode 2, the 16th of May, and Episode 3, the 19th of May. So many of us will remember seeing the original trilogy films back in the 70s and 80s. Christy, you saw the prequel films first um, and then moved on to see the original trilogy films. How did you feel about seeing... What what were your first thoughts about seeing the original trilogy films after having been exposed first to Star Wars and the prequel trilogy? I'd always had a slight curiosity about the original trilogy. I'd heard snippets of things growing up, but um, during my childhood... The, the, the mentions of Star Wars that I had been exposed to, it felt like a very American thing. It wasn't easy for me to sort of get a hold of it. You know, as a kid, I couldn't um, go and buy these things and just sort of watch them when I wanted to. Um, so when I was sort of finally old enough, when episode two came around, I was like, okay, they're making a huge fuss of this. There was a, a big sort of um, advertising campaigns around it so I went to go see it on opening night and I I knew instantly okay this is why people like Star Wars and so after that it was sort of a, a quest to source as much as I could I remember I bought the episode one uh, DVD and sort of watched that as much as I could and at the time I had to get a set of the original trilogy VHS from I bought it on eBay from the UK because I was sick of waiting for something to show up locally because back then there were no DVDs of the original trilogy so local Star Wars fans in New Zealand were not letting go of their VHS so I had to track some down from overseas and watch them for the first time now as a child I had actually been spoiled on the big thing because I used to read you know the kids magazines and that and there was an article talking about Darth Vader chopping off his son's hand so I I I I didn't get that moment of finding out the big plot point sort of for real, but that didn't in any way spoil my enjoyment of the films. So I certainly have such a sort of a fondness for the for the prequels and that being sort of my first exposure to them. Obviously, some people think that, you know, with the lightsaber battles, 
in the original trilogy a little more sort of muted compared to the very fast pace of the prequels but it didn't it didn't sort of affect my enjoyment obviously princess leia resonated with me very strongly she is one of my highest sort of favorite star wars characters i collect a lot of her and of course padme being so central in episode two and the love story there they are characters that really resonated with me but yeah i certainly kind of got it lucky in that coming in with episode two that was the first movie that New Zealanders got at the same time as the US. So I've never had that theater delay that other fans would have experienced. So I was able to watch the movies at the same time as the US or because of the time difference, New Zealand actually gets them about a day, a day and a half earlier than the US. So we don't end up with that sort of anxious wait or any potential spoilers. Yeah, we've been waiting. I mean, from about episode two onwards, we've been getting them on the same calendar date, so a little, actually a little bit earlier than, than the US. But even episode one, those of you who were fans in 1999 will remember that there was nearly a month's delay before we got that in New Zealand. So, yeah, it's interesting um, to hear the, your experience of not actually having to suffer through those long delays. I mean, there wasn't an internet back well, in, in 99. Certainly, there was a little bit of exposure that you had to try and avoid to dodge spoilers certainly not really well a little bit there was a little bit of this back even in the original trilogy because um information did show up in comics and and magazines and uh you know over a six month period you know there was an occasion to come across plot points and i must admit i actually read the comic adaptation of return of the jedi before seeing the movie so i knew some of the major spoilers to that but it didn't affect my first viewing so a question for the audience what was the first original trilogy film or the first Star Wars film in general that you saw or saw in the theatres and what are the strongest memories you have about that did you see it with friends did you see it with family did you see it at a local theatre or watch it on VHS I did enjoy the Star Wars marathon that New Zealand cinemas did a couple of years back so I finally had that opportunity of seeing the original trilogy on the big screen and that was a lot of fun um, being able to share that with our daughter as well so for her first big theatre experiences. It would be fun in maybe in the future for them to do I don't know if they do all nine as a marathon <laughs> maybe over three days that last time they sort of did you know um uh, the original trilogy on one yeah. day and and the prequel trilogy on another day that would be kind of fun that was actually a good event i remember that um because all fans around the country were talking about it and, and it was, i think it worked really well it was really popular at the time and it was really cool that um the advertising for that because it was something that happened locally and in australia but the advertising for that had some very unique branding on the on the posters with the with the silver fern okay let's talk a little bit about the new zealand store reports things that we've reported on the SWNZ website as being released or becoming available locally. First up, we talked uh, when these came about for pre-orders, but they are now shipping from Mighty Ape, Star Wars lithographic art prints from Acme Archives. They have quite a wide range, most of which um, of these limited edition art prints come in about the 18 inch by 24 inch size range, so a nice size for display or framing. They will ship with a certificate of authenticity when they come from Acme Archives, and the starting price is in the $70 to $80 range, so quite reasonable for high-quality, unique artwork. I've always been a fan of the Acme Archive Star Wars art. I remember sort of discovering this at Celebration 3 back in 2005. Yep. They had a big booth, and I thought it was amazing that there was Star Wars art, not just the posters. I mean, the posters are iconic, and I'm sure just about every Star Wars fan has those um, amazing Drew Struzan artwork posters, but I really appreciated the artwork of individual scenes and characters, some of the scenes that we don't see, and sort of these little quieter moments. And over the years, they have been a little more pricey to source. Some of the art prints ship flat, because of the thick cardstock or canvas that they are on. So that makes international shipping quite expensive. Of course, if you buy some of the more sort of um, thinner cardstock uh, lithographs, they'll ship them rolled, which does bring the price down a little bit. But I'm very excited to see that Mighty Ape is finally stocking a wider selection of their prints. Makes it much more achievable for New Zealand fans and keeps the price point quite, um, quite affordable. Yeah, so we actually did pick up one of these, in particular a Princess Leia art print, so we can confirm that Mighty Ape is packaging and shipping these appropriately. It turned out flat with a good amount of protective cardboard packaging around it. 
that was an art print that you particularly liked, wasn't it? Yes, a very, very pretty uh, Princess Leia from Empire Strikes Back that shipped completely flat with its um, backing board and certificate of authenticity. So Mighty Apes knowing how to how to handle these um, very pretty art prints. They're definitely worth checking out. Cool. Okay, the Wedge Antilles Black Series X-Wing helmet is shipping now from Pop Guardian. They have had really good pricing on Black Series one-to-one scale helmets recently, and they've got this one with a list price of $185. If you use the code SWNZ5 at checkout, you'll get an additional 5% discount. I'm a real big fan of the Star Wars Black Series helmets. We've probably mentioned this in previous podcasts when we're talking about Black Series helmets, but they're a fantastic level of quality for the price point. I've been collecting Star Wars helmets since late 99, early 2000, when I got my first fan-made Stormtrooper helmet kit set. And we've collected a lot of helmets in association with costuming, um, but also for display. And the Black Series helmets have really filled a gap in terms of being affordable but highly accurate display pieces. I've seen them compared against more expensive pieces like Inovos and EFX, and they stand up really, really well. So we're quite looking forward to getting more X-Wing helmets in particular. We've got an example of an EFX collectibles X-Wing helmet and some fan-made ones that we use for costuming that we've painted up. I've painted one up as a Wedge Antilles helmet. Um, I'm quite keen to do a bit of a lineup of the EFX versus the Black Series versus the fan-made ones just to sort of compare the level of detail. And I think the Black Series ones will stand up really well. A lot of the helmets historically have either been almost impossible to find in New Zealand, either the price point or just availability, or the fan-made kit sets. And because the fan-made ones are obviously unlicensed, you kind of have to go through the secret fan channels to find them. And then when you get them, you often have to know how to build a plastic helmet and paint it and put it all together. So the fact that Hasbro was managing to do these helmets for a very affordable price, a lot of them even have electronics in them. Oh, yeah. Lights and sounds, just for that sort of fun. I know it's probably not as... A play feature, most collectors will probably put this on a shelf and not run around the house pretending you're in an X-Wing. But I think that those are fun details that they're still managing to fit in around the $200 price point. And all the stickers, all the paint job, you don't need to do anything. It's good to go out of the box. And rounding out the New Zealand store reports, I just put it up on the SWNZ website today. NZ Mint have released a... 150 gram silver miniature figure of Grogu, aka the child, a thousand to be released worldwide. Um, a very unique collectible. It's coming from New Zealand Mint. It's not part of their coin line per se because it's not legal tender, but it's a really interesting piece. 150 grams of silver is a solid little collectible, and it's quite a high price point as you would expect with that amount of precious metal in it. It's over a thousand dollars, but I think worldwide these will be quite collectible. It's a very nice sculpt. This would appeal to people that like things like the Royal Selangor pewter statues or even the Swarovski crystal statues. I know there has been a Grogu released in that line as well. It's sort of one of the smaller but higher price point, sort of more luxe collectibles that will make for a really unique little display. All right, let's talk about the... Most recent episode of The Bad Batch that came out last Friday, episode 4, entitled Cornered. In this episode, we saw the Havoc Marauder traveling through space. They identified that they needed additional fuel and rations, food supplies, and they were looking to go to a planet called Ida Floor, which is an uninhabited planet. But it became clear that they are being tracked because of the um, identification signature of the ship, so they needed to address that to make modifications so that the ship couldn't be identified and tracked, and that required making a stop on Pantora. While on Pantora, they had an encounter with Fennec Shand, the bounty hunter, who we first saw in The Mandalorian. This is an episode we've kind of been waiting for because we knew that Ming-Na Wen would be showing up as Fennec Shand in The Bad Batch, and we weren't disappointed. One thing I found a little bit interesting about Fennec Shand showing up in The Bad Batch is that The Bad Batch takes place 19 years before the Battle of Yavin, whereas the Mandalorian takes place 9 years after the Battle of Yavin. So that's a 28-year time span. So it's kind of interesting that they're showing a character at two points in the Star Wars timeline that, that far apart for a new character. It sort of feels like the um, the difference in time between Saw Gerrera, where we see him sort of in the in the Clone Wars, and then sort of um, just after 
obviously Order 66 and his sort of younger self, and then we see the live-action version of him as an older, jaded sort of rebellion fighter in Rogue One. So Fennec Sand's fairly brutal as a bounty hunter in this episode, and we don't learn a lot about her, apart from the fact that she's communicating with someone else to discuss the bounty on Omega, as, as that we presume. Not clear who she's talking to. It may be Cameron Owens or it may be some intermediary in the Bounty Hunter Guild or somebody else that she works with. But like I say, she's uh, she's actually quite a violent character, um, often quite a few civilians and police officers uh, in the process of trying to pursue her bounty, which is a, a little bit different from her appearance in The Mandalorian some 28 years later. There are a few... I mean, it was an enjoyable episode. I enjoyed the way Echo... Um, disguised himself as a droid to you know help progress the plot and um, get a hold of the materials they needed and that worked well with the subsequent plot point of needing uh, assistance from droids to put the ship back together in a hurry so they could get off planet in a hurry mild bit of trivia is that the voice of the protocol droid that echo encounters um, was voiced by voice talent gray delisle gray griffin um, who is going to be making a virtual appearance for virtual autograph signings at an upcoming Armageddon convention. We talked about that a few podcasts back. She has appeared in person at Armageddon in previous years because she has done voice work for the Clone Wars micro-series and tends to pop up in all sorts of little Star Wars things. She's a quite a prolific voice actress. She's done a lot of incredible voice work, but I'm particularly fond of her voice work from the micro series and also the Star Wars The Old Republic video game. So it's fun to see her still continuing to pop up in the modern Star Wars animated series. So the plot was fairly straightforward in terms of um, an encounter with Phoenix Sand and a narrow escape. There were a few bits of trivia that I found quite interesting. I enjoy I enjoy seeing the fact that they've got the power droid that lives on the ship with them, Gonky, I think he's called, um, actually uh, having a little bit of a role um, to a certain extent in, trying, in the ship repairs or ship modifications. Um, Pantora is an interesting planet that we've seen, an interesting moon actually. It's the, the moon of the planet Autoplutonia, homeworld of the Tals. Um, Pantora was, has been seen in the Clone Wars, and of course you'll know that Famous Pantorans include Baron Papanoida and Senator Chi Ikwe, who were portrayed by George Lucas and his daughter Katie Lucas in the prequel trilogy, Episode 3. Something else that really caught my attention was the Celestin fueling depot manager. When, they, when he went back to his office, he had an interesting model of a ship on his desk. It was just blinking your miss it sort of a thing, but it really stood out to me because it's a ship profile that I'm quite familiar with. The Soro Sub Personal Luxury Yacht 3000 um, has shown up a number of times in the Expanded Universe and the canon. It's the luxury yacht that's been used by a number of other Star Wars characters, and I don't know if there's any significance or just a little bit of a, a drop-in to the scene, but the, the, that yacht has been used by Lando Calrissian way back in the old Expanded Universe. He had a ship um, of that model called the Lady Luck. It's also been used by Mara Jade. I think the Jade Fire was the name of her version. And Chancellor Palpatine's even used it, I think, in the Clone Wars. Not sure if that'll come to anything, but it just stood out to me as a really fun little addition in the background there. This particular episode didn't really go back and look at what's going on with Crosshair and Tarkin True. and the other sort of Imperial storylines. This one centered primarily on the Bad Batch and Omega and their sort of adventures on Pantora with Fennec Shand chasing them. I thought it was really fun that we don't know who Fennec Shand is working for. We see her talking on her sort of communicator to someone but we don't hear any voice we don't hear any other side of the conversation so it'll be interesting to see if this gets revisited or it's just sort of like a little fun thing just sort of putting in a character that's a new sort of um, addition to the Star Wars saga and I want to see if this is sort of pointing towards Omega being a lot more special than maybe she and other characters are aware of that somebody's going out of their way to hunt her down. Yeah, I think that's the case. Yeah. Um, so I'm re really going to be seeing if it's 
if this is what the Kaminoans were sort of talking about, sort of like a, a second generation of clones, and they suddenly realize that they need her genetic material to make more clones, and they need to sort of go and find her to get her back to clone her, you know, have they accelerated something about her genetic makeup in some way that makes her more of an efficient sort of fighter slash soldier? It's going to be interesting to see how they sort of drip feed this story out to us in the upcoming episodes. Yeah, so talking about Omega, her role was obviously central to a big part of this recent episode. She didn't have a lot of dialogue, but I do like the way they're developing her and and developing her character slowly but surely. I, I like the little scene of her sort of being a bit enchanted by the um, clone trooper toy that she picked up. It felt like a little callback to young Jin Erso yeah. and her little stormtrooper wooden doll. I thought that was cute. She recognized it as a clone trooper and she was looking at one of the Bad Batch <laughs> when she was sort of you know thinking about what that meant. Hmm. And clearly they're developing the relationship between Omega and individual members of the Bad Batch um, as they go and uh, demonstrating the protectiveness that's that's growing for her by the um, members of the Bad Batch, Rekka in particular, seem to be the case. I think, just circling back to something you mentioned, I think the closing scenes showing Fennec Shand talking on the communicator strongly imply, and at least this is how I hope, hope to see it, strongly imply that she is going to show up again and to further explain the significance of Omega, um, why she has a bounty, why she's being pursued. And um, I, again, like you say, we don't know who she was necessarily talking to. It may be someone significant and interesting, or it may just be someone we already know about the Empire or the um, not probably the Kim, Kim and Owens, more likely. But yeah, I think, I think that leaves the door wide open for her return, and uh, I look forward to seeing that. I'm really enjoying just seeing a little bit more of Fennec Shand. She's obviously a really intriguing character in The Mandalorian. There is a lot there about her history, her connection with Boba Fett, and I'm obviously really excited to see where they take her character in the book of Boba Fett, but I'm liking that they're giving us a little bit more of a historical backstory. It'll be interesting to see if anything that happens in The Bad Batch ends up being referenced in some way, because obviously she's she's not not exactly on the clone's side but then all those years later we see her working with Boba Fett which obviously has a relationship to the clones yeah. um, in that era um, so it'll be interesting to see how they flesh out more of her story and backstory. Obviously she's a little bit of a side character in the Bad Batch but I like that they've pulled her in because I think she's a really intriguing character and ming Na Wen is such an amazing actress. Well it was also interesting to see her doing specifically voice work for Star Wars and a Disney production of Star Wars because she's done voice work for Disney before, of course, hasn't she? Yes. If you're not aware, she is the original voice of Mulan from the classic animated uh, Disney movie. So she is a Disney princess through and through. So it's fun to see her coming around. Obviously, she had a major role in the Marvel Universe, being one of the major characters in the S.H.I.E.L.D. TV series. And now they've got her doing Star Wars as well. So it's fun to see her under the big Disney umbrella doing some really fun roles. So all in all, the episode last week, a fairly tight episode. I don't think anything from it is directly going to um, show up in terms of the plot in tonight's episode, Friday night's episode, uh, because it was. I, I think we'll come back to it at some sub subsequent episode, but I'm looking forward to seeing, as always, where we go with tonight's episode, and we'll talk about that in next week's podcast. On that note, that's about it for this installment. I guess we are done doing talking. As always, we thank you for tuning in. We appreciate you taking time to listen to us share our passion for Star Wars. Stay tuned to our website, srnz.co.nz, for Star Wars news for New Zealanders. In another podcast episode next week, jump on over to either our Facebook group or the SWNZ message boards to discuss all the latest Star Wars news with other Kiwi fans. Thank you for listening. And may the Force be with you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, go ahead and like the video check out the SWNZ podcast playlist for our other episodes and subscribe for alerts about new episodes. See you next time.